All right, so having introduced our different possible wedge functions, we are now in a position to um, study the properties of the matching model and um, figure out what are the type of unemployment fluctuations that are generated uh, by the uh, matching model. So what's our objective here? So our objective uh, is driven by the empirical evidence that we highlighted for the US. Um, so what we want to have is, um, first of all, we want to have a counter-cyclical counter unemployment fluctuation. So that means that when employment is uh, high in good time, you know, we are going to have low unemployment. And when unemployment is low, we are going to have high unemployment. Okay, so that's clear. We also said that we want uh, unemployment and vacancies to move along a beverage curve. So we want therefore to have a pro-cyclical um, vacancy rate. And as a result, um, we'll also have a pro-cyclical labor market tightness, right? Because if vacancies are pro-cyclical, so vacancies go up in good times, down in bad times, and if unemployment goes down in good times and up in bad times, and clearly the labor market tightness, which is vacancy divided by unemployment, it has to go up in good times and down in bad times. So we want to have a pro-cyclical uh, tightness. Okay. Uh, so that's what we want, and also, uh, so these are qualitative properties. And in addition, we also know that uh, unemployment fluctuations, they're also quite large, and we want to be able to match that amplitude. So we also want to have large And so what does large mean? Well, large is going to tell us that we want that when there are um, shocks, unemployment basically responds as strongly to these shocks as in the data. And I'm going to show you how we can measure the response of unemployment to the shocks and, and in the model what the predictions uh, are. Okay, so basically what we want is that we want that the elasticity of um, the unemployment rate with respect to the shock is the same as in the data. Right? So that's what we uh, that's what we want to have. Mm. All right, and um, so here what we're going to do is that we're going to contrast um, two possible submodels, if you want. Um, so we're going to look at um, two types of wedge functions and contrast their properties. So first, we're going uh, to start with a rigid wedge. So we saw earlier that we can have a fixed wedge, we can have a rigid wedge, and in fact the rigid wedge is just a generalization of the fixed wedge. So that's why I'm not going to study the fixed wedge in particular. We can always derive the property of the fixed wedge, what happens with a fixed wedge from those with a rigid wedge. So we're going to see a rigid wedge, and then we're going to see what happens if you have a bargain wedge. We're going to contrast these properties, and we'll see that actually uh, rigid wedge and bargain wedge have quite 
uh, quite different properties. Um, and so we're going to explain uh, we're going to explain that. Okay. Um, and we'll see in fact that the bargain wage will have a hard time uh, matching what we see in the data and in particular with the bargain wage we'll see it'll be very hard to get large unemployment fluctuations. Uh, something that you will see also in your reading the paper by Scheimer uh, is exactly about that, um, that I've assigned uh, as a reading. Okay, so we're going to start with a rigid wage and see how the model behaves uh, once we have a wage function that gives a rigid wage. We're going to study the matching model with rigid wage. All right, so uh, to figure out what happened in that model, what do we need? Well, we need to know how you know, tightness and unemployment are determined. How are these things determined? Well, they are determined uh, from the labor supply, the labor demand, and our equilibrium condition. Okay. So we have a rigid wage, so it means that the wage is going to be equal to omega to the wage level A, the labor productivity, and gamma, the parameter that captures the rigidity of wages. Okay. Uh, remember that gamma is between 0 and 1. Where 0 is a completely fixed wage, and 1 would be a completely flexible wage. Okay. Uh, all right, so in that setup, what's going to be our labor supply? What's going to be our labor demand? So the labor supply of dependent theta is always the same. It's f of theta, where f of theta is the job finding rate, s, the job separation rate, plus f of theta times h. h is the size of the labor force, okay? The labor demand, right, so in general we said that it was a, Labor productivity, alpha, the shape of the production function. Here, I'm supposed to have the wage, but the wage is omega and gamma, so that's just my wage that is introduced here. Okay. Uh, times 1 plus tau of theta, alpha, then 1 over 1 minus alpha. Okay, so that's our labor demand. So here we're in a position to simplify a bit the labor demand. Um, now that we've introduced that assumption of rigid wage. So we'll get M1 minus gamma. Here what I've done is I've simplified the labor productivity in the numerator and denominator. Time alpha and by omega. Omega is just a um, uh, parameter. 1 plus tau of theta alpha. 1 over 1 minus alpha. Right, so that's our labor demand. So, um, first question that we want to answer now is that we have our labor demand, labor supply. Uh, and of course, so here we have both the supply and demand, they both depend on tightness. The question is what is the tightness prevailing in the market? Uh, and of course, the tightness prevailing in the market is given by our equilibrium condition. And the equilibrium condition, as we said, was that the labor supply is equal to labor demand. And of course, that's an equation that's going to determine, uh, that's going to give us the labor market tightness uh, that prevails on the market. That gives us the equilibrium. Tightness. Okay, great. Um, 